Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. We begin tonight in Elmira, where several officers were injured by inmates at the Elmira Correctional Facility. As Big Fox's Mac Hindens reports, this happened in separate attacks. That's right, and good evening. Two inmate attacks resulted in five officers being injured, two of them requiring treatment at a local hospital. The Correctional Officers Union tells me this is part of a larger trend. Last Monday kicked off a violent week at the Elmira prison when an inmate escaped his cell and threatened to kill an officer with an ice pick like weapon. The ensuing struggle resulted in one officer being punched in the face while another hurt his arm and knee while restraining the inmate. Three days later, another attack occurred while transferring an inmate back to his cell. That fight resulted in one officer breaking his thumb, one with a cut under his eye, and one diagnosed with a concussion. They're frustrated. They feel handcuffed. They're not able to do their jobs. Mark the Burgomaster of Niscopa tells me violence has increased throughout the state's prison system. He believes the closing of state prisons, relaxed disciplinary measures, and short staffing is creating violent settings and frustrated officers. They don't feel like they have any support from the state or the department. Relaxed rules are going again, you know, obviously in favor of the inmates and against the officers. The Burgomaster believes the state needs to provide more staff support to quell the violence. It's getting to the point where people want to go home. They don't want to hear I have to work five, 16 hour days because I'm being mandated every day. That adds to the tension in the jails. At least six inmate attacks have been reported at the Elmira prison since last December. I reached out to the Department of Corrections, but have not heard back. Matt Clinton's Big Fox WYDC in Corning. Duncan is bringing back Iced Coffee Day on Wednesday to raise money for the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. Duncan will donate a dollar for every cup of iced coffee sold at participating locations. Megan Parsons says the money donated will go a long way in addressing food insecurity throughout the region. If you think of that iced coffee that you'll be consuming that day, we'll be able to turn that into three actual meals for people who need it. That's super significant, and so that means that every single dollar really does count. Since 2018, Iced Coffee Day has raised more than $38,000 for nonprofits in the Southern Tier. Data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention outlines how many people have become sickened or died from COVID-19 after they were fully vaccinated. The CDC reports 1,949 breakthrough cases of COVID involving hospitalization or death have been confirmed among the vaccinated population. Of that number, 18% of the cases were fatal. 79% of the total infections occurred in people 65 years or older. All the cases involved patients at least two weeks after receiving a second dose of Pfizer or Moderna's vaccine, or one dose of Johnson & Johnson's. The CDC notes such breakthrough cases are rare. As we reach what is hopefully the tail end of the COVID-19 outbreak, the CDC releasing a new report on schools, recommending that teachers and staff continue to wear masks. Jonathan Sari has more from Atlanta. The numbers are all heading in the right direction. COVID-19 cases down 19% in the last week, with hospitalizations falling 15% as more Americans get vaccinated. A big focus now, expanding access to young people and protecting them in school until they can get their shots. The CDC releasing a new study on Friday recommending masks still be worn by teachers and staff, pointing to new data showing the masks lowered infection rates by 39%. We have used this transmission risk for many of our CDC guidance materials, for example, our school guidance. But most states are well on their way to reopening schools without requiring masks. And some governors have signed new orders imposing fines on any official who makes face coverings mandatory, including in the classroom. It is time to put health care decisions back in the hands of parents. More than 125 million Americans have been fully vaccinated, but rates are slowing down. The daily average dropping from a peak of more than 3 million to just 1.8 million this week. A number of states now offering special lotteries as an incentive for folks to get their shots. And they say it's working. The vast number of people who are not yet vaccinated are actually not opposed to getting vaccinated. And so with things that draw attention to it, uh, like, like the lotteries in those states you mentioned, um, are not surprisingly very effective. 
And as demand falls here in the U.S., we're shipping more doses overseas. Pfizer pledging 2 billion shots for low-income countries over the next 18 months. In Atlanta, Jonathan Seri, Fox News. In Georgia, a fierce debate breaking out over whether schools should teach a curriculum known as critical race theory, which some parents consider controversial. As Alex Whitler reports, one district has opted to ban teachers from teaching the subject. People protesting critical race theory chanted no CRT well into the night and during a Cherokee school board meeting. School leaders vowed not to teach it in schools, but many meeting goers say that promise is not enough. At least 400 people crammed into the Cherokee County School Board Auditorium or watched the meeting intently from the window. Among them, Georgia State Representative Brad Thomas, who was the first speaker during the public comment period. He says he's drafting a bill to ban critical race theory in Georgia. We pulled language from Tennessee's bill. We pulled language from Texas's bill. Critical race theory, or CRT, examines concepts like white privilege and racial equity while looking at how the country's system of laws may or may not benefit people of certain races. The majority of the boisterous group in Cherokee County was there as a show of force demanding the district to prohibit CRT and other forms of inclusion from its schools. Those who fail to sow don't read. The group cheered as the Cherokee superintendent made the announcement that neither CRT nor the 1619 project will be implemented. The school board also decided not to move forward with a diversity, equity and inclusion initiative or DEI that other school districts have adopted. If you vote to do away with the DEI program, does that mean the new DEI administrator has her offer rescinded? Because why do we need to job to do anymore. But that applause was short lived, turning to booze and unrest as the school vowed to maintain its social and emotional learning. By looking at census and looking at tax records, etc., you can kind of see that this community, regardless of what people say, it's not very diverse. Um, and ultimately, in the lack of diversity, it didn't sway us from moving here because at the end of the day, you'll never get diversity if you don't move in. I've seen firsthand the benefit of diversity. Meeting goers weren't shy during the public comment period either, often interrupting those with differing opinions. <laughs> The meeting happening just hours after Governor Brian Kemp penned a letter to the State Board of Education calling critical race theory a dangerous ideology gaining favor in Washington, D.C. Georgia State Representative Brad Thomas says a bill to ban CRT in Georgia could be drafted as soon as July. Asian Americans can now walk the street with a little less fear in San Jose, California. A group of volunteers is now patrolling the streets with the aim of preventing violence against that community. Amanda Del Castillo reports. Red vests signal relief and reinforcement for seniors in San Jose's Japantown. Part of Japantown Prepared, the all-volunteer community emergency response team, new foot patrols are focusing on preventing attacks against the elderly Asian community. They're very exposed and very vulnerable. So I thought, you know, we had to do something to try to improve their safety. Retired SJPD officer Rich Sido says the March 10th attack on an Asian woman at Deardon Station led him to launch the effort. Right now, 65 volunteers have been trained. Walking around Japantown with a big group of people uh, talking about what to look for, what to be aware of, and how to respond and handle certain situations. One of the first people to answer Saito's call to action was Franco Imperial. When we first started volunteering, we we got a lot of thank yous and you know sighs of relief that there were folks that had their back. Imperial says Japantown is no stranger to racism, pointing to the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. There is an awareness of our history and um, the willingness of very kind-hearted, warm-hearted people to step up. Saito is optimistic these lengths to keep seniors safe from hate will ease once the pandemic is over. He's hoping that day will lift pressure off people who feel they need to lash out because of the lack of jobs, social interaction, and more. And if it gets to the point where we feel that the community is safe again, then we can end the patrols. But we're committed to staying with it as long as it's beneficial. The Capitol Police Union says more than 70 officers have resigned or retired since the deadly insurrection. 
On January 6th, Capitol Police officers defended the Capitol complex and lawmakers for hours against a violent mob that breached the building. They were seeking to stop Congress from certifying the 2020 election results. While well, the police union suggests low morale is a major factor in officers' decisions to leave. Since the insurrection, many Capitol Police officers have faced double shifts and six-day work weeks. A law enforcement source says there's been more turnovers this year than normal. Still ahead tonight, as health officials continue to urge Americans to get vaccinated, some say a COVID-19 booster shot may be needed sooner rather than later. It's highly likely that within a reasonable period of time, we're going to wind up requiring booster. What top health officials are saying about the timeline for Americans to get booster shots. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Your Big Fox forecast is brought to you by William Matar. Today, we did surge into the 90s, record-setting heat across many of our hometowns. Of course, that really affected our air quality as well. The good news is we're going to see a little bit of a cool down this weekend. However, it still is going to be about 10 degrees above normal. Moving into the evening hours, we are going to see those temperatures drop down into the 50s, 58 degrees at 4 o'clock in the morning, and then 61 degrees by 6 o'clock. So it's going to be a mild start to the day tomorrow and you know it is going to be unseasonably warm ahead of a cold front that will be moving through on the weekend. So for your Saturday, there could be a few isolated showers that pop up late in the day, but throughout the morning hours and early afternoon, temperatures will gradually warm up. We're talking about readings that will be back into the 80s. Our average is around 72 degrees for our high and overnight lows average around 45. And we're going to start off about 10 to 15 degrees above normal for your Saturday. And then we're going to see another warm up in the afternoon. 81 degrees at 11 o'clock, 83 by your one o'clock hour. And then temperatures will drop down into the 70s in the late afternoon. There is the possibility of a few isolated thunderstorms late in the day as well. Once that cold front comes through on Sunday, we will still be located south of that front in the warmer sector of the storm system. So temperatures will be close to record in some of our hometowns. But once this cold front comes through, we're going to see a big drop in temperatures by your Monday. So we're talking about 10 to 20 degrees cooler than what we're going to experience on Sunday. High pressure builds in. It will bring north winds back. And that's going to bring us to a little bit closer to normal temperatures. So our future radar is showing for tonight increasing cloud cover early tomorrow morning. There could be a few showers near Hornell at around 2 o'clock in the afternoon and then a few more showers moving in in the evening. We start off dry on Sunday, but by the end of the day, there could be a few thunderstorms that will roll through before that cold front comes in. And then once that cold front comes through, drier air will start to take over and we're going to see some sunshine by Monday as a result. Here's a look at your forecast tonight. We drop down to around 58 degrees in Corning and also in Elmira, 61 degrees in Perkinsville with increasing cloud cover. Highs tomorrow about 10 to 15 degrees warmer than normal. A high around 83 degrees in Elmira and also in Corning. And we do have the possibility of a few thunderstorms late in the afternoon. Here's a look at your extended forecast staying warm through the end of the weekend and then 10 degree drop on Monday with a high around 72 and then we recover rebound back into the 80s by the middle of the week with the high around 84 on Wednesday. As health officials continue to urge Americans to get vaccinated, some say a COVID-19 booster shot may be needed sooner rather than later. Mandy Gaither has details in today's Health Minute. It's one of the best defenses against COVID-19, but the protection vaccines provide wanes. It's highly likely that within a reasonable period of time, we're going to wind up requiring booster. But Dr. Anthony Fauci says a timeline for when boosters might be needed is still unclear. Moderna has already been working on a booster shot, a half dose of its vaccine to fight variants like the ones first seen in South Africa and Brazil. 
Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is a one-dose shot, but the company is testing a two-dose approach to see if it enhances efficacy. As for Pfizer, the company hasn't yet finished its trials on a booster vaccine, but its CEO says in the next couple of months there will be enough data to know more. Likely there will be a need for a booster somewhere between 8 and 12 months. That's within a year after a person's been fully vaccinated, according to Pfizer's CEO. But boosters aimed at specific coronavirus variants may not be needed. Instead of having to play whack-a-mole with each individual variant and develop a booster that's variant specific, it is likely that you could just keep boosting against the wild type and wind up getting a good enough response that you wouldn't have to worry about the variants. Less than 40% of all Americans are fully vaccinated. Almost half have had at least one dose. And because of that, the CDC's latest forecast predicts newly reported COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths will likely continue to decrease over the next four weeks. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. A young man in St. Paul, Minnesota, is not letting cerebral palsy stop him from living a full life. And that includes going skydiving with his best friend. Devon Raming reports. We all have a story. Most definitely. And the two things our stories have in common are a beginning and an end. But it's the experiences that set our stories apart. Meet 24-year-old Isaiah Shackleton. He has cerebral palsy. Um, he can't walk, he can't talk. Never give up. But that part of his story isn't keeping him from living life to the fullest, especially with his best buddy Carter Peicher by his side. They've been friends since high school and reconnected last summer after Peicher lost his job due to the pandemic. You know, one day he just messaged me and he's like, hey, do you want to come help take care of me? And, you know, you'll get paid to hang out with me. I tried to plan exciting things for us to do instead of, you know, just sitting around inside. With Peicher being an avid skydiver, it was only fitting those plans would somehow lead to a leap of faith. I wanted to show him it, and as soon as he was out there and saw the parachutes landing, he's like, when do I get to do it? And a year later, we are going to go make some memories right now. A promise fulfilled. The, here he goes into the plane. I almost cried when he got on that airplane. I was just like... Oh my gosh, she's really going to do this. Isaiah, are you ready? The smile, one of the most greatest things I've ever seen. Like, it was infectious. Proving in this case that the sky really isn't the limit. Excellent, I will doing it again. Just do it and never give up. When I can help him achieve his goals, also helps me achieve my goals. Because if he can do something, I can do something and vice versa. Yeah! A California family celebrating the news of a hiker being found after he was missing for five days in the wilderness. Rachel Kim talked to family members about his rescue. And so we're up at the top of the hill and we start coming down and then we hear the bullhorn saying he's been found. You have no idea. <laughs> so relieved. Rebecca Lotta felt relief and gratitude when the LA County Sheriff's Department's Air Rescue 5 spotted her brother deep down in a canyon after he had been missing for five days. We didn't know for days. Not knowing is so hard. The search efforts began Saturday night after 58 year old George Null went for a day hike in the Buckhorn Mount Waterman area and never returned. For days, volunteers and authorities scoured the terrain on the ground. Today, during an aerial search in Bear Canyon, the airship spotted Null waving at them near a creek in a very remote and rugged part of the Angeles National Forest. He was soon hoisted into the helicopter. The area that he was located was at about 2,500 feet. Well, the mountaintop that he came off of in order to get there is at approximately 8,000 feet. So over several days, he's made a lot of progress downstream. He gave me a huge hug. I think he's so exhausted that he really doesn't have a lot of words right now. And he's maybe a little bit delirious after five days of wandering around in the forest. Lotta says her brother is an Eagle Scout and experienced hiker, but he told her he got disoriented in an area where authorities say a lot of the trails are burned out from the Bobcat fire. So since then, the Forestry Service has, been, has closed these areas and recommended hikers don't go in them, so that way nature can heal as well as you know the trails can be fixed and the signs can be replanted. I, I don't know if he didn't have a compass or he wasn't using it, I'm not sure. A really wonderful thing to be able to reunite with him and, and have that opportunity to see him again. Move over Popeyes, step aside Chick-fil-A. Make way for a new entrant into your chicken sandwich wars, Kellogg's. And no, there's not a new chicken sandwich flavored breakfast cereal. 
sorry to disappoint some of you, Kellogg's also owns Pringles, and it is adding that flavor with an extra spicy chip in partnership with Wendy's to promote its spicy chicken sandwich. The new chips will only be available for a limited time starting in June. And here's something that might grab your attention. People who buy a can will also get a code for a free spicy chicken sandwich. Pretty good deal even if you toss that can directly in the trash. Cher is celebrating her birthday by announcing a biopic about her life. The singer and actress turned 75 years old Thursday. On Wednesday, she tweeted the producers of Mamma Mia will produce a film about her life. Cher will also serve as a producer on the film. No word yet on what the picture will be called. Cher has appeared in plenty of acclaimed films of her own. She won an Academy Award in 1988 for her performance in Moonstruck. A dog named Spork now has a wheelchair just like his owner. She says the little guy helps her go about her daily life. As Marley Ginter reports, now Spork is getting a little help of his own. Spork's daily walk can be unpredictable. Your whole hind quarters are shaking my bed. But Kimmy Anderson is always there to lift him up. Spork has a degenerative disc disorder causing paralysis in his back. But things are about to get a little easier. So Kimmy, this is Tanya. She's all the way in Pennsylvania and she wants to help you and Spork. That's so amazing. You see, the last time we introduced you to Kimmy, things were pretty tough. He's still, you know, the thing that gives me hope on bad days. But keeps me going. Kimmy, already in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the waist down, lifting Spork every time he falls isn't easy. And when Tanya Dybul saw our story on the other side of the country, she couldn't resist the urge to help. So this is personal for you then? Absolutely. This is truly personal. Tanya runs nonprofit Joey's Paw in Pennsylvania, named after her rescue dog, Joey, found on the side of the road at six months old with his back legs cut off. If this was meant to be one way or another. We were going to get to me <laughs> now connected. Joey's Paul will pay for the mobility device Spork needs. Thank you so much for um, sharing her story. And I'm so thrilled that we can help her. I am just beyond thrilled about this. And then so. you're just like, finally, something's going great. Spork had already stolen Kimmy's heart, now inspiring others far and wide. I'm like, overwhelmed with gratitude. I can't believe that during such a hard time, so many people can be so generous. We want to leave you with a smile tonight, a birthday celebration on full display in Rhode Island. Literally, Edmund, better known as Fast Eddie, was celebrated on his 105th birthday with a surprise billboard. According to Eddie's daughter, the family wanted to do something really special for him because he broke his hip last year and he's had a tough time recovering. She says he loves his birthday and being the center of attention. So dozens of his family members met Eddie in a parking lot off a highway on Wednesday. He was escorted out of a car and then told to look up. The giant digital billboard had his photo on it and wishing him a happy birthday. His reaction was priceless. From our whole team, thank you for joining us. We hope you have a great night.